Asella uh, Libro FM. Uh, it's interesting we've just been talking about the weather. It's, maybe this could be a question mark. Mark's little bio on Libro FM says that he enjoys running in the rain um, as well as <laughs> running Libro FM um, and uh, eating undercooked food. So some interesting things there, Mark, <laughs> to maybe get into later on. Um, but he is the co-founder of this amazing platform called Libro FM, which was launched in 2014. And um, Mark, thank you so much for coming along today and talking to the network about what Libro FM does. Um, there'll be plenty of chance for people to ask questions. So please do start posting them in the chat, getting ready your questions for Mark. Um, but otherwise, Mark, thank you very much. And I'll hand over to you to tell us a bit about uh, Libro. Yeah, well, thanks so much for the opportunity to meet with uh, you, most of you in the afternoon and uh, some of you in your mornings. Um, uh, since we have a smaller group, uh, absolutely want questions and more of a dialogue we can have about audiobooks. Uh, we were even talking about audiobooks prior to our call here, and there's so many different directions we can take the conversation. So I want to, to hear from you. Um, you know, where we want to take the, the conversation. But I, I probably should start with a few general comments about Libra FM and who we are and where we're headed. Um, I'm not sure if everyone can see in the chat, but I did drop some links um, to the Libra FM site. Uh, I don't mind if you, if you browse while, we, uh, while I talk. <laughs> Feel free to click on those links. Um, I guess to start, you know, um, Let's go back that, you know, audiobooks is probably one of the oldest forms of storytelling, right? I mean, we were telling stories around a fire uh, before we were reading books in print, right? Or ebooks. Um, and so why is audiobooks the fastest growing category in publishing for the last 10 years? I think it's just a part of who we are as people who love good stories and it's it's really ancient and what's exciting to me uh, as someone who um just loves books and loves marketing is uh, the chance we have in 2024 to get more people into books and audiobooks are a gateway to do that and we can use technology for good right we have these phones that we take with us um, pretty much everywhere we go and have them. And we can access these incredible books through our phones. And so I just wanna start the really high sort of meta level there of really inc how incredible this opportunity is to leverage this technology in a positive way to get more people into books. Because the reality is that um, uh, the reading is not a growth industry. Right. I mean, it's been relatively flat and in some ways we can celebrate that fact like it hasn't just dropping off a cliff reading. Right. But we are not. Uh, and I say we because we're all book lovers here. Um, we're not Netflix. We are not a streaming service that is seeing, you know, um, billions of dollars uh, of, of getting poured into content and huge growth and people spending, you know, four or five hours an evening immersed in streaming. Right. And so to me, audiobooks, and it's proven so, um, is that that gateway to get someone into books and bring more books into their life. And I talk to people all the time about audiobooks. Uh, I also um, help out with our customer service uh, often on the weekends. Uh, and uh, I talk to um, our 10,000 plus books I always work with all the time. And um, the people who are listening to audiobooks Shortly after telling me, you know, a book they recently enjoyed, they tell me the activity they do when they listen to that audiobook. And there is this strong connection between listening to a book and the activity you do. Um, so I'd be curious, actually, uh, if, if any of you all listen to, to audiobooks, maybe you can drop in the chat right now um, an activity you do uh, while you listen to audiobooks. Um, so for me personally right now, um, what I enjoy the most uh, is say a Saturday morning um, and when I, I, I'm, I'm from Seattle, so I love my coffee. In fact, I'm drinking coffee right now um, to have a good cup of coffee and tidy up the kitchen for 45 minutes to clean the kitchen 
uh, and listen to a book when the house is quiet. Um, that gives me so much joy, that combination. Um, and uh, as I was saying before the call, I absolutely love uh, print. Uh, I'm a big print newspaper reader still. Seven days a week, I read the print paper. Uh, I spend enough time on a screen. Um, but it's the fact that I can listen on the go. I can I listen in the car. I listen while walking. Often, um, my neighbors hear what book I'm listening to because I don't use the earbuds. I hold the phone when I listen to the book. Um, so, um, and I'm seeing some great examples, uh, yeah, in the chat. So that's, that's to me, is just uh, sort of the, the insight into how this is growing. Now, when, where Libra FM comes into this, um, so I have a background as a book publisher. So I, I was a book publisher for 10 years. Um, and I did books that had a chance to impact the world and to become bestsellers. So I published you know, one book every two years. And I really enjoyed that. I also saw my audiobook sales um, grow significantly during that time. And majority of those sales, more than 90%, were coming from Amazon's Audible. Uh, and I didn't like that. Um, I, and I, I didn't feel that I was treated fairly uh, by Audible in terms of how much that I was getting paid as a publisher, how much my author was earning from those sales. And then I looked at my friends who are running bookshops, and I saw that they had no way to participate in the growth of, of audiobook sales, right? You know, how is one individual bookshop able to, you know, form uh, agreements with publishers, build an app, build a website? I mean, it's not possible for one indie bookshop to do that all on their own. And so uh, through years of conversations, uh, two years in fact, we listen to booksellers of, of what, what they want and what would they envision the future of audio look like with their bookshop. So what emerged is uh, we created uh, a co-branded storefront. So you have Libro FM and the local bookshop. And so a customer at that time could simply buy a book a la carte uh, with a credit card uh, and download that book. We didn't even have an app when we launched um, uh, 10 years ago. Um, and one bookshop at a time, uh, we have grown to now we work with uh, more than 2,800 uh, local bookshops and we've, we've signed them up one at a time. So today, what that looks like, uh, there's 175 in the UK and Ireland. We are truly global. Uh, we sell in six currencies. Um, so in the US dollar, Canadian, uh, pound, euro, Australian dollar, and New Zealand dollar. Uh, we work closely with book sale associations uh, in those countries. We have members right now in 73 countries around the world who are listening to audiobooks uh, through their local bookshop. Um, we are a social purpose corporation. And so we have no investors. Um, we've built Libra FM um, as a long-term investment um, partner of bookshops. And in many ways, our investors are the booksellers. It is booksellers uh, who believed in our vision for audiobooks um, and technology from the very beginning. And they want an alternative to Amazon for their customers. They want to keep their customers in the ecosystem. So they have put their trust in us. And we, we take that very seriously um, in terms of the the products we build and how reliable they are, this customer service we offer. Um, and so we just launched uh, six months ago uh, and uh, outside of the United States and Canada. And um, we're seeing a similar path to what we've experienced in the United States um, in that uh, like good, all good things take time. Uh, and so we have a great foundation um, and we're in the process of signing up um, about 50 to 60 bookshops a month uh, continue to sign up. So we have a big vision to network all the world's bookshops in all languages to be able to sell audiobooks. That's our actual mission, uh, but our vision is so much broader. 
Um, we are in the, here to, to serve bookshops in whatever technology needs they have over the long term. And um, so that's a little bit of, about us. Um, maybe there's some questions now. I know we have a few questions are already submitted, um, but I don't want to just keep talking if the, uh, uh, off target. Mark, maybe you could just talk to us a bit. More. So how did the company develop and grow? You know, was it just you? Um, I know I've seen from the website, it's still quite a small company in terms of people, but how did those people come together? And, you know, how did you plan the steps to make this uh, a reality? Sure. Um, so currently we have 18 people. Um, we have 16 in the United States. Uh, we have two uh, in the UK. Uh, Android developer and a customer support specialist. Um, so that's our company. We are fully distributed. Uh, we've never had an office even before the pandemic. Um, we've been entirely virtual. Um, it started where uh, I turned uh, to a college friend uh, who got a PhD in computer science and said, you know, can you help me build an equivalent to Audible? And he says, yeah, yeah, I can do that. <laughs> so here we are 10 years later. Uh, of course, uh, it's uh, we built everything from scratch. Uh, we don't rely really on any other systems or other uh, partners. It's all built by our team, um, which is really significant. Um, so it's been a lot of work, but yes, slowly by surely, one at a, one person at a time, we've, we've grown the company. Um, and uh, built the, a, a larger catalog. We didn't start with 500,000 audiobooks. We started with about, I think, like 15,000. Um, so it's been, yeah, a really incredible journey. Um, Has anyone else got any questions for Mark at this point that they'd like to jump in? Can I ask, can I ask um, where did the audiobooks come from? Good question. So the audiobook distribution is, and, and I'm happy to go at a deeper level here, um, is a little bit different than the standard, say, print uh, distribution and publishers. So the, the largest publishers in the world, um, they uh, right now are pretty much producing audiobooks for every, most every title, right? And so they've worked hard for many years to develop their you know, relationships with narrators, and it is impressive the, the output they do, you know, with the the volume and the quality, which it keeps the the, the bar goes up and up for the the, the 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 audio production quality. So those are the largest publishers. Now you have um, sort of uh, maybe the independent publishers, who they often now have licensed their rights to audiobook specific publishers. So there's publishers uh, such as um, uh, recorded recorded books um, that license the right to um, produce the audiobook um, edition. Now they don't do print books; they just do audio. So from the publisher perspective, they get um, an upfront payment, and then um, typically um, uh, they earn uh, royalties based on um, on sales once that advance is um, is earned back. Now. I think in some degree, we, we gave some credit for this as well as just the whole growth of the industry, but you have seen, you're seeing a shift where some of those publishers, instead of licensing, are saying, we want to own the production. We want to own the marketing. We see the value of audiobooks. We're not just going to take the easy money, which is the check from the audiobook publisher. We want to do it ourselves. Um, and now there's a bit of a learning curve involved uh, in terms of the, the production but also um, the, there is significant cost. So the way audiobook uh, cost works is the narrator's charge by the finished hour. So it typically, so let's say the book is 10 hours. They're probably putting in 30 to 40 hours of work for that 10 hour book, maybe even more, right? There's the, the work up front where they, um, they're, they're reading the manuscript, they're making notes about, how do I pronounce this, you know, obscure word, right? There And uh, the top ones even have uh, like an assistant who will go through and mark up the manuscript for them 
you know, and do all that work. <laughs> um, but they get paid on the finished hour. So the, the rates range from, I mean, we'll just say 150 to $350 per finished hour. So you do the math, the math and those, sorry, that's US dollars. <laughs> uh, so it could cost, you know, four to $5,000 for uh, an audiobook production, uh, which is significant for, for, for any publisher, right? And so then you have to look at, okay, how many audiobooks do you need to sell? How much revenue to even to get that money back? Um, so that's a little insight. Now, what's also happening at the same time is you have um, um, some self-published authors uh, who are recording the audiobook themselves, partnering with narrators and using a variety of platforms now to, to get their audiobook out there. Um, so there's more audiobooks than ever before. Um, what really matters for, for our industry though, is making sure that especially the first few audiobooks, they're really good. What we don't want is for someone to have like two bad audiobooks in a row. And I say bad in terms of like, you know, maybe it's like a, an, uh, um, com uh, com computer generated voice, right? I mean, if that's someone's first experience of audio, uh, that is troubling, right? Because they we may lose them. They might go back to watching Netflix, you know. So, so to answer again, so we we get the audiobooks from those publishers, the largest publisher in the world who we work with, as well as the, the audiobook uh, distributors. That was a good question and a great answer, Mark. Thank you. I suppose the obvious follow-on question for that is as much as possible then, could you take us through, I know some of the, a bit like bookshop.org, some of the profit, pro, profit's probably the wrong word, but bookshops get some funding from every sale made. So could you perhaps, as much as you can, t talk us through the Absolutely. business model? How does it, how do the, you know, how did the money stack up? Great question. Um, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll do another more in-depth answer uh, since we have a, a chance like this. Um, hopefully it's interesting to you all. Um, so the customers uh, of the bookshops, they, they really have two choices right now. Um, so one is they can buy an audiobook a la carte, which is basically one at a time. They can use a credit card and buy an audiobook. Um, now, the pricing of audiobooks in that scenario ranges from really low and maybe it's you know, two or three pounds on up to 30 plus pounds. So there's this full range. And so some of them, you know, don't want a commitment. There are they're, they're too many subscriptions elsewhere. They just want that one book at a time. And, and so about, about 20 to 25% of the customers choose that. But there's a better value if a customer becomes a member through a local bookshop and, um, that is um, 9.99 uh, pound, 14.99 US dollars. And what they do is they get one credit uh, per month. And then they can use that credit to get uh, uh, an audiobook. Um, so the, where, how the bookshop gets compensated, if somebody buys the a la carte, um, the bookshop will get uh, 20 to 30% of whatever the customer spends. Um, in the model where they, um, use a credit for a membership, the bookshop gets 10%. So the, the margins are, um, they, they are quite different across those different, those models, right? Um, in the subscription model, a customer is, is basically getting their audiobooks at half, half price um, as, as part of that commitment to a monthly subscription. So that's how the bookshop gets less in that model and more in the a la carte model. Thank you, Mark. That that makes sense. <laughs> Eben. I think uh, Gail had a question earlier. Sorry, because I, I missed the very first few seconds and I think you might have answered this already, but um, I wasn't entirely clear about whether you were um, as it were, supplying bookshops or supplying individual um, subscribers? 
I'm sorry. Can you ask that one more time? Oh God, I think, can you not hear? I can, sorry, I can hear you. I just want to make sure I understand. Okay. Right. I was, I was just saying, sorry, I've got a cold and everything as well. Um, I was just saying that I wasn't entirely clear whether you were, uh, you work through bookshops or whether you have individual subscribers, but I think you've kind of answered that now. That's a, that is, that is a great question. Um, so, I have two parts, I guess one, um, when a customer, uh, creates their account, um, they have the option at that point to choose the, a local bookshop. And the way it works is uh, we, we, we know a general location and we will suggest the closest bookshop to them. So that's one way. But another way is that the bookshop have a unique link to a homepage that they will share. And if a customer gets an email from the bookshop or sees a post on social media and they click on that link, um, that they're automatically assigned to that local bookshop. So they don't, they don't choose. Um, so that's, uh, that's generally how it works. Um, there is also a button that uh, they can select that says, I have no bookshop. Um, so our numbers are 95% of our members have that local bookshop. Uh, only less than 5% say I have no bookshop. So that's really important part of our model is to, to connect someone with the bookshop. Right. Okay. And, and it's nine ninety nine per book, is it? Correct. Per credit. Yes. Right. Okay. It's just, I, I put in the chat, you might not have seen it, um, is that my partner, um, listens to audiobooks the whole time um okay. and he's a voracious consumer therefore um and uh yeah i mean there's two different things one is the type of book he would like to be receiving um you know because he does get a bit fed up with rom-coms and um westerns and things um but the other thing is you know like if it's if it's nine ninety nine a book, then that gets very expensive. If you know you want to be listening, absolutely. To, you know a lot. The, a lot, a, a little bit more on the the pricing because um, so we're as I mentioned, we're a social purpose corporation. Our mission is not to maximize profits at all. We want we're building a sustainable business um, that will maximize what the local bookshop can make, but. There's a in the in the UK. There's a twenty percent VAT tax on audiobooks. There is no to VAT on eBooks. So we hope that that law is changed, right? Because that twenty percent is significant, and that's why the the nine ninety nine is VAT included. Right. So books become twenty percent more expensive, and I think you have a, a, a I mean accessibility issue, like if you know it are. If if someone really can't read print, you're you're penalizing them. You're for for just not being able to to read print, right? And you're taxing them. So um, that's a big that's a big reason why that's twenty percent ex more expensive, right? So that that's meaningful. You, what is um, if I may? What is the rationale? Do you know um, for the law, or is it just obsolete? And um, tech, you know, it's another case of technology surpassing the law. I mean, that's that just seems unbelievable to me. I mean, I believe you. I don't mean it that, but it just I mean, it's so illogical. <laughs> maybe some of our uh, friends who can speak uh, more directly. I, I've only read general newspaper okay. articles about <laughs> this. Um, I I know it. It was. It's. I know even from the Bookshop Associates' perspective they've gone back and forth a little bit on on their their own perspective of what position they should have with tax also in in light of amazon right and so i think there's like there's a multiple uh things at play here of what what is fair right and what should be taxed and so forth so it's complicated uh -huh. yeah yeah 
Well, I also wonder about ebook lobbies. Do you know because <laughs> um, yeah. because I do think I think um, uh, audio books. I, I said something like this in the chat, but because you can multitask, they allow you. I mean, I think in a way they uh, they would surpass. Um, the growth of digital because digital has uh, ebooks, um, at least before COVID, had kind of platformed out for a while, the sales. But I could see audio increasingly growing in popularity and not presenting a danger um, necessarily to, to, to print the way people thought that ebooks would. You know, I mean, they, they both are coexistent. They, you know, um, but just because we're in a busy world and multitasking is favored. So when you walk or when you clean, uh, I, I laughed at um, Sam's remark because I tend to clean when I have to write something. <laughs> I oh, yeah. it's so true. Yeah. <laughs> you know. But anyway, and, and so, uh, you know, I thought about that. And how do you find, um, this is a question for you, um, um, could you say even more about compete, it, competing with Amazon and marketing, you know, to kind of because um, they have they've cornered so much of the market. I'd just be interested in hearing your thoughts on that. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to add a link here to the chat. Um, it's our switch page, which has more information um, about Libra FM as an alternative. Um, we're actually in the process of um, a, a new campaign uh, this month uh, to switch people from um, Audible to their local um, bookshop. Um, we've even gone back and forth over the years of, um, you know, how much to talk about the competition in this way. So there was a period where we say, we're, we're not even going to mention them at all. We're only going to talk about, um, you know, the value of buying locally and, but then, you know, it's, it's, I mean, like in the UK, it's like 90% audible. It's like, we have to address that. And in fact, um, you know, there's audible customers shopping at local bookshops and we need to address them. We need to switch them from audible to the local bookshop. So, um, so that's where this, this link comes in. Um, and, and, and that is, it is a sales objection, right? In, 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 when a, a bookseller talks to a customer. And so we need to be able to say, you know, why Libro, what's the difference? Um, and we outline um, a number of things on this link, but I mean, first and foremost, it's, it's keeping your money local. Um, but I think we're proud of what we've built in our app experience and it's really good. And um, I think customers can tell that um, we, we really do, uh, and love books and we're not trying to sell you, you know, diapers or other products, right? Which you, you know, I mean, that's the Amazon model is the everything store. So I think customers will appreciate in terms of the technology we have that's that's 100% focused on books and, and not anything else. So, But for fun uh, and, oh, is it not here? I have to share with you all um, the Amazon Audible uh, breakup letter that uh, we we had meant several years ago uh, we put on posters. I'm gonna I'm gonna drop this link in the chat here. So it's a breakup letter. It's called "It's Not You, It's Me," and it's about somebody breaking up with Audible and then uh, joining uh, Libra FM through the local shop. Thanks, Mark. I look forward to reading that in a second. Paul, you did have your hand up. Have you put it down? You just changed your mind, or would now's a good time to come in if you'd like? Yeah, to? sorry. No, I've got a I've got a sick child here at home, so I put uh, it down because I may be called into the next room momentarily. But um, Mark, this is really interesting. Sorry if I missed it earlier, but um, I was wondering if we could return to the subject of artificial intelligence and digitally voiced audiobook. Um, yeah actors and i think it relates somewhat to the issue of competition because as we know amazon and other vendors have allegedly been flooding the market with a lot of bad ai generated texts yeah. 
I work in and I'm researching the field of academic publishing, and I've been hearing from some publishers, and this is a very specialist space, that there is interest in using generative AI to digitally voice texts where it would otherwise be prohibitive, prohibitively expensive to, yeah. to do so. I'm just wondering, do you have a, for me, it's a it's an ethical situation. Sure. Um, do you have a position on this? Is it a point of differentiation from big firms like Amazon? And are you getting wind of sort of differences within the various publishing fields uh, concerning, you know, who's going to be making the the who's going to be making use of this technology to bring their uh, their titles to market in this way? Yeah. Sorry if that was badly phrased. I'll, I'm a bit no, distracted. It, at the moment. It, it is a it is a great question. Uh, and we're still in the early days of uh, unpacking what we mean by um, artificial uh, computerized voices and what that looks like. I can give you several examples as well as um, our stance. So, um, and we're in the process of, of uh, putting together a podcast of probably several episodes even on this topic. Um, but it is something, of course, a top of mind. And I think it even caused quite a stir uh, AI at the London Book Fair uh, this week. So I think first and foremost, what our goal is, is to, if we have something that's not entirely human, we need it clearly labeled by the publisher and we need to tell the customer um, that this is not a, a entirely human voice, that this is, um, a synthesized voice. This is AI, and we owe that to the customer. And I, and we are telling all of our publishing partners um, that we need that requirement. And it, and it's going to take, I will say, six months before I think we even get the full compliance uh, from publishers. Because the the fact is, audiobooks are being dumped onto our platform right now that are not labeled synthesized voice. It just happened this week, you know, where the, and again, going back kind of the earlier process that you have like several layers now where it's not a concern from the big publishing houses. They are not doing um, um, yet <laughs> AI generated voices. But what you have is you have these like a uh, distributor, like uh, which is Spotify, find a way. And they're getting tens of thousands of audiobooks from companies or self-published off authors and they're and they just then go from they go they upload them to to find a way and and spotify and then those titles go to us and then we see like it happened this week where it's listed as a human narrator a, a person's name and you listen to the book and it doesn't sound like a human and sure enough we we push back and say you know even though you have a name here, this does not sound like an entirely, gen and they say, oh, you're right. We went, went back to this original source and no, it's a poorly done male synthesized voice across not just one title, but like a hundred titles, the same bad, bad AI voice. Now, I, now there's even a debate and we can talk about, there's, there's, I think there's AI that's, that's pretty good, uh, right? Um, but there's some voices that uh, it's just not going to cut it, right? And 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 it's a total disservice to have. But I mean, at a, a basic level, we just have to tell our customers that you know, you know, this is computer generated. Now, um, I was talking with with Sam earlier. You know, we have the ability to listen to a sample before you buy, and then it's up to the customer. Like, you know, they may listen to the sample and say, okay. That kind of works for me. I realized that if it weren't AI, I would not be able to access this audiobook otherwise. It wouldn't exist. And then that's their decision to make. But we absolutely have a responsibility to tell people, hey, this is 100% human or no, this is, um, yeah. So that's just a little insight into what's happening like this week <laughs> in the world of AI and so forth. Um, so but yeah, it also goes back to the very high production costs that we were talking about earlier. And um, we, you know, we we do have AI generated voices from um, uh, University of Chicago Press. They have a lot of academic books that they it it just the economics don't work 
for them to pay $350 or $400 a finished hour. They don't think that they're going to get the return on that investment. So they have a choice to make. They either, it only lives in print and ebook. Okay. Or you know what? They, they, they partner and they make the best quality AI narration they can. And, you know, the ideas have a chance to get shared globally. So th those are just some of like the, the issues at play. And, and so um, they're complicated. All right. Thank you. Really interesting. Thanks, Paul. That's a great question. I you, you go off on a whole thread now about open access. I know we could go on and on. And... <laughs> but that might be a whole different session. It's... Um, but yeah, thank you, Paul, for asking that. And Gail, you've got your hand up. Would you like to ask? Jim? Yeah, well, I mean, it, it's kind of uh, it's following on really from from what Paul was saying uh, to some extent, but it, and it's also related to my previous question. But let's uh, deal with with the academic book. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, unfortunately, uh, my partner's had to go and lie down. So otherwise, he might have even come on and asked the questions himself. Um, I mean, basically, you know, when I was saying about he gets fed up with rom-com and uh, westerns and stuff, I mean, basically, um, he's an independent scholar, you know, he wants to lay his hands on academic books, which it's obviously the, it's a small market like I mean I'd actually quite I mean, he would quite like to be in touch with Paul later if um, you're doing this kind of research um, but I I think um, yeah I, I think the, the the question of minority interests which comes up in a lot of different directions um, is is actually is important and um, you know, when I was saying before about um, that he's, you know, he's quite a voracious reader, even of rom-coms and stuff, to stop him getting bored. Um, <laughs> but he just told me that um, he has a, a monthly subscription to Script, which is... Mm. <laughs> Um, which is also nine ninety nine a month, yeah. but what it means is that he can listen to as many books as he likes, and of course he doesn't want to own them because he just wants to listen to them once, and if he can find anything to listen to, you know. Um, so I think I mean you did sort of say before that there are, it's a very segmented market, you know. There's there's different mm -hmm. approaches, there's different models and so on. So, you know, anyway, sorry, I'm just kind of really interested in this from a personal mm -hmm. and, a, you know, scholarly point of view. Absolutely. The, the script, I don't know yeah, how popular it is in the UK. Um, the It sounds really good because it's 9 dollars pound for all you can listen right um well they're missing a lot of great audiobooks and and that is uh what their challenge is um and they haven't been able to figure out over i think it's like 10 years they've been in business and raising more than maybe like 150 million dollars so um i think it's a it's a flawed model right because they're missing 50 percent of the books that people really want to listen to um, so while there's value to listen to half of the books that you want, uh, you really want it, it, there's gaps, right? And so oh. that's where um, we have, you know, 99% of the bestsellers. The only books that we really don't have um, are the ones that are exclusive to Audible. And that's where Audible, um, uh, you know, bought the rights and, and they don't let anyone else uh, uh including libraries digitally listen to those, uh, have access to those audiobooks. I want to take that a little bit further, actually. Because uh, when I think about the digital book market, the streaming book market, it has been very difficult for other companies to find a model that's sustainable. Yes. Because you have to get lots of people to sign up but not use the service. Yes. In order to... <laughs> yeah. 
Is that sort of because every time they read one of your books, you have to pay a royalty of some sort, or listen to one of your books, they have to pay. You have to pay a royalty for its yeah. access. Yeah. So just kind of to break that down, um, I think you have to first look at the 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 companies that offer audiobooks, right? And then look at uh, who owns them. Uh, is it a publicly traded company? Is it owned by a private e private equity firm? Yeah. Are they trying to go public and uh, and position the company uh, to 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 uh, go public? And uh, you follow the money. This is this classic saying. And and then you say, okay, well, why are they taking uh, this action? And when you get down to it. Um, it's not about books for these companies or the cultural aspect. It's about the Wall Street. It's about boosting the value of their company. And so um, there, some companies are willing to take a loss in order to get enough users, and they call them users, we call them customers, um, so that they uh, can either sell the company um, or uh, boost their stock price. And so whether that's, you know, the reason why Spotify is doing audiobooks is they want, they say they want to own the ear. Uh, they need to grow, right? Uh, they can't just continue in, on the path of doing music. They have to add something new to, because there's no end to uh, the expectations of Wall Street and in the stock. So you have to just keep going. And so that's why they're investing the billions of dollars in audiobooks is they see it's growing and they have no other choice but to do that. So I think that's what is, I think, uh, what, you know, to kind of answer Gail's question, I think it's a challenging uh, aspect of our company in, in that um, the details, we, we, we believe they do matter. Like we do, the ownership matters and why you're doing something and that we're going to be around for a long time. But it's hard to communicate that to the general consumer out there. Um, no, yeah, I, so if anyone I, has ideas, <laughs> we're yeah. open to it. We're making I, progress, but in terms of like at scale, right? I mean, we're we're really tiny relative to the size of those big tech giants that surround us. No, I can certainly see that. My um, what I'm trying to figure out is again, I mentioned before with the Sync strategy, I was talking to you about the Thompson book, the Book Wars, and it, he describes the book streaming services that tried to get themselves started, and they seemed to succeed for a while, but they couldn't manage because every time a, someone took a subscription, you had that regular payment. Yeah. But every time they read a book, you had to pay the publisher a certain portion. So the idea was you need lots of people to join the thing, but not read. Yeah. And the theory behind this model, uh, which in the United States has been done by, I think it was called like a movie pass, right? Is that if you get enough users, like millions of users, and then you can go to the publishers and say, well, we need better prices because we have millions of users yeah. and it hasn't worked that out that way. Yeah. All right. So that's why these companies, they come and they have these great prices and then they're out of business yeah. or they don't have a, a future. Yeah. But you think the model you've got seems to be sustainable and it's supporting the, the goals of the business of your business, your may of working with the bookstores and the like. Absolutely. I mean, we're, we're open to more long, other models long term, um, but what it, it, we just understand the core economics and first that we value um, the authors, right, and how much work goes into a book and they need to be compensated fairly. Um, so we want to preserve the value of, of the audiobooks. And I think that's consistent with uh, the publisher perspective as well. Um, and that is a concern with, and some agents have voiced this over the Spotify model, is that uh, I, it, it does feel uh, in a way like uh, you're getting an audiobook free. I mean, you're paying for music and then you get up to 15 hours of audiobooks. And so, and then it's like, well, when I look at paying for a book on Libra FM or elsewhere, there's actual significant cost at $9.99, right? And so there, there is some concern. Um, among the agents that says, are we, are we, we're bringing in more people, but are we devalue, are we, is, are we losing that value of the book? Yeah, yeah. that's nice.
One other question. Um, as a bookstore, how do you join? Ah, great question. That part is easy. Uh, I can drop a link here in the chat uh, to sign up. Um, it's just basically providing, yeah, your logo, your link to your website and so forth. Um, it's pretty easy to get going. Um, it usually takes a couple of days to, to turn your website live. Is there any betting that goes on or just you just check to make sure it's a real website, that sort of thing? Um, there is uh, some betting. Um, we first uh, you know, want to make sure that if a bookshop is in um, the US or Canada or UK, Australia, New Zealand, that they are connected with their bookseller association. So in the UK and Ireland, like they are a member of the BA. Um, if they're not a member, we we want to know why, right? Because uh, that part is, and, and is very important to us is the network uh, of of bookshops and and that they're they're legit uh, operations and 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 there and that's an, kind of another question is the line is a little blurry now of what is a a, a bookshop if if you're only online and um, I know there's hundreds of new online bookshops in the United States. Some of them feel more like an affiliate, you know, where, uh, but then others are like, you know, it's a full-fledged bookshop. They just happen to be all online. And so th that's an interesting question to consider too of in the future of like uh, many people that can sell, uh, sell books and, and say they're a bookshop. There we are, Robin. And get going now and <laughs> set up on us as a, as a customer. Um, Mark, if I can, I'd like I'd like to ask you a bit more about the the activism side of Libra FM, which again really interested mm -hmm. me when I was reading through the website and the six key values that you list there. And then there was a a really interesting section about um, things like the Amazon Prime Day offer that you did, um, offering Danny Kane's book How to Resist Amazon and Why as a kind of free download for that day. You know, how successful are those kind of campaigns? And also the campaign that you did about the banned book titles, where, again, you sort of open them up for free download. Um, that seems very exciting to me. We've, we've had um, some recent talks for the network um, from, from people talking about how bookshops can be used as sort of sites for activism. And and so I'm interested to see how this translates to something like Libra FM, which is a kind of online audio book platform. Yeah. Um, good question. So I think first and foremost that we we are the, a platform for the bookshops that to curate audiobooks to express themselves in however they want to do that, right? And so I always say if like if Libro is successful, it's not because of our eighteen our, our team of eighteen people, right? Um, we build this platform, but it's successful because we have really passionate book selling partners who are curating playlists, which are our collections. They're, they're, they're books about banned books or identity-based or sci-fi novels, right? So it, it, our, our company, ref, it, it reflects the uh, uh, what bookshops are actively doing and we facilitate that. Um, so it's, it's really less about us, you know, huddling and saying, you know, we want to be activists. We want to do all these things. It's like we respond to what uh, we, we follow the lead of what the local bookshops are doing. And so I, I think it's and we work with so uh, and that's been the most fun part is we work with so many bookshops and, you know, like we just celebrated Mother's Day in the UK. Uh, Mother's Day is not uh, is, is not till uh, May in the United States. Right. And so uh we we have to make sure that uh, it's not just us that's generating the stuff, but it's it's coming from the bookshop, so everything is localized. Um, that said, um, I think part of our the strategy is absolutely to have leadership across the world that says, uh, "Here's our stance um, on uh, shopping local and and really an alternative to Amazon and." Uh, I think long term, I hope we look back and say, and, and as well as like groups like this, the Books on Network, which is why I said absolutely yes to to join this today. Is I, I think we have to have build stronger uh, bonds globally, 
and and like align on these larger campaigns of alternatives to Amazon, right? Um, and I think um, that's that's but that's what we've been doing, and that's uh, like with the Switch campaign and the Prime Day is these are global efforts that we can all um, work together on. So, for example, we. Uh, we're on all the social channels. We're on Instagram. And I heard we, we had 70,000 people follow us total now, which is pretty good. But if you look at how many followers 2,800 bookshops have, it's in the millions and that influence, right? And so if, and we, at times we have uh, created these campaigns that have, um, uh, gone, I, I, I'll say kind of viral in terms of Prime Day, but uh, where we have, you know, a thousand bookshops that are sharing something on social media. And that's when um, collectively we can actually achieve something. Uh, and that, that's, that's the goal uh, is that we, and so we have uh, celebrations in the U.S. We have our independent bookstore day at the end of April. We have, of course, in the U.K., um, I guess it's October uh, in New Zealand and, and uh, Australia. So um, yeah, that's the goal. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thanks, Mark. Eleanor, Ooh, we've lost Eleanor. Oh, she had to go. I think that's why she was waving at me. Yes, yeah, she did put in the chat, didn't she? She had to go early. Um, all right. Well, that we are coming up to the hour, Mark. So unless anyone else, I'm give, just giving anybody a chance to put in a, another question. Matt, you come online. I'm guessing yeah. that means yes. Yes, and I'm I'm sorry I'm walking to pick up my daughter from school, but <laughs> um, I, I'm based in Warsaw, and I was kind of curious, but based on your map, um, and I think you kind of answered this with Evan's question earlier, but w with like foreign language markets, yeah, and, and what I mean, like I guess it gets to be difficult to check reliability, or even of the content that you're posting. I don't know how do you how do you manage uh, the foreign language market. Yeah, so we want um, all audiobooks that exist globally in all languages, right? So we want that and we're getting that. Um, it just happens that, I, you know, the audiobook production is way ahead in English markets, right? Um, okay. Spanish, uh, there was just an article in a panel in the London Book Fair this week. The estimate is like there's 20,000 Spanish language audiobooks, but it is is seeing a lot of growth there. Um but really, there should be 200,000 or more audiobooks in Spanish, yet there's only 20,000. Um, so that all is going to change in the five plus years ahead. I mean, we're going to see just this global expansion in all languages um, over time. And I, I guess on the quality and curation part, I mean, that's where we where we it's not we were going to we have to rely on um, our, our local bookshops to do a good job of like, uh, writing the bookseller reviews, which they do. These are hand, you know, one at a time. I'm a bookseller and I really like this book. And then that goes onto the app that gets boosted in terms of um, visibility on our website. So we have this platform, but we rely on the local curation. And and again, that's why this is going to work. I think long-term is our the customers, they appreciate that. It's not just an algorithm. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. Okay, so it's a really, it's an easy question to finish on. Well, it's easy for me to ask. I don't know how easy it's for you to answer. Um, but given reading through the report, looking at all the, you know, exciting things that you, you've done, even in the past 12 months, you know, the expansion internationally, all that kind of thing. What are your aspirations for Libra FM next? I mean, where do you, where do you go from here? Yeah, so... I think next um, is we we truly want to be the global partner for all bookshops, and we have a long ways to go um, in terms of not only English uh, bookstores that have English language books, but um, books that are sold in all languages. And so you can go to our map, and and that's an assessment of where we are. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of gaps, and so we need to be in Poland. We need to be in every country in the world. Um, at the same time. Uh, what's so important to us is the relationship we have with the booksellers one-on-one, -on -one, serving them. A lot of it's through email, of course, but we're real people behind it and, and they know that. So that's that's sort of our vision. That's the vision for the future. How can we can we get to 10,000 bookshops, really every bookshop in the world that's independent, but yet also be really human and 
uh, and not lose that in the process. Thank you, Mark. Um, and yes, that was, I think, just about well time. We're just hitting the hour now. Um, so can we uh, thank Mark, whether you want to do a virtual clap or a real time clap um, for his time this afternoon? I'm sure there will be many more conversations and bits of research, Mark, that will follow up from this session. Um, and yeah, as you say, it's really good just to have you here to talk about it and just raise visibility about what you're doing. And that, again, there is an alternative to that place that we shall not mention. Um, I'm going to stop the record button. Oh, no, I can't. Evan, can you stop recording? <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. I, I did put our email address.